G'day, it's Preso back in the shop today and today I'm trying something new. This is a tool that I made some time ago. It's a tailstock tap holder. It consists of a Jacob's chuck, a body and a shank uh, with a half inch uh, spindle on it and that allows the chuck to rotate and also slide along the axis of the lathe and it keeps the tap concentric with the axis of the lathe while you cut the thread. Now, if I take the Jacob's chuck off, you'll see that this is just mild steel. It's been polished, looks great, but I guarantee you that in a month's time, this is going to be corroded and crusty and horrible. Now, the problem is that the uh, climate that I live in is called a subtropical climate. We get warm, humid days. As soon as the sun goes down, the temperature drops and moisture will condense out of the air onto any surface that's relatively cold. So, uh, bright metal surfaces like these uh, get a film of moisture on them. If there's any dust or you know, grit or, or grime on the surface, that traps the moisture even more. And pretty pretty soon they start to look pretty horrible. Here's one that I made a while ago. This is a tailstock die holder. And as you can see, the surface that was facing upwards on the shelf has attracted that dust and grime and the moisture. And that's what it ends up looking like. Now, when I made this one, it looked like that. And I treated this with a cold bluing solution. So you just put the cleaned metal part into the solution. It goes black within a couple of minutes and that does provide you know, a decorative coating, but it's not terribly durable. Once it gets to this stage where it is corroded, the only way to fix that is to put it into a, a rust conversion process. Um, you could use a vapor rust, which works reasonably well, or you can mechanically clean that with emery cloth or steel wool or a, you know, like a, a wire wheel. Trouble is that that removes the coating that you've already put on it and you're back to where you started from. So what I want to be able to do is to use a hot solution or a hot treatment process for this and it's called a Parker phosphate solution or Parkerizing. It's popular with uh, gunsmiths, uh, it's used on mechanical parts. Um, there's, there's a whole host of reasons why you use it. Now the materials that I purchased for doing this came from a company called Jane Plating Kits. There's their web address if you're interested and I'll put a link in the description below. They're a company uh, here in Australia uh, they're very good because their delivery times are short. They sell in small quantities suitable for a, a DIY enthusiast like myself. And they cover in this book lots of different metal treatment processes. So there's uh, nickel, cobalt, nickel plating, zinc and copper plating. Uh, you know, it goes on and on and on. And the book uh, outlines just simple common sense methods that you would use with diagrams and, and very clear instructions. Now, they are not a sponsor. They didn't pay me to say any of this stuff and I paid cash for all the materials that I bought. Believe me, I bought it all. So I'm not, I'm not promoting them because um, you know, they've done something for me. I'm promoting it because I think it's, they sell good products and they're, they're a good solution for DIY enthusiasts like myself. So that's my reference uh, for the process I'm going to use today. But first thing, we're going to get this chemically clean and then we're going to prep it uh, and then I'll show you the process for the parkerizing. Now one of the difficulties with parkerizing is that you need to heat the Parker phosphate solution up to a very narrow range between 94 and 96 degrees centigrade. So it's, it's not good enough really just to put it on a stove and let it boil. Uh, you, you really need to keep it just off the boil. Now, this little hot plate that I purchased some time ago is good, but the thermostat is not accurate enough for what we need to do. So in my a previous video that I did, I showed how to make this uh, standalone PID controller. And this allows you to put a K-type thermocouple into a pot of water or any sort of chemical solution and then accurately heat it up and hold that temperature. In the previous video, I showed how to make this uh, probe and make it uh, so that you could immerse it in the solution without worrying about any of the solution getting inside the wires and the insulation and so on. And when I made it, I just dunked it in there and I left it sit there. And I did say that at some point I was going to bypass this thermostat altogether. 
Now, luckily, one of my viewers pointed out that that's probably a bad idea. Uh, the reasoning was that if for some reason this probe were to fall out uh, or it failed, you would get an open loop feedback, which means that the PID controller would either register room temperature or no temperature, and it would just keep heating the hot plate indefinitely. And you could get a situation where the thing would fail catastrophically. So uh, I realized later on that that was uh, you know, a possible outcome. So I'm gonna keep the thermostat in place. I'm not modifying the hot plate at all. I'm just gonna leave the thermostat at its maximum temperature and will allow the PID controller and the K-type thermocouple to do all the work. Now, when I made that video, I sort of thought about it afterwards and realized that there were lots of other applications for this standalone controller. It means that you can plug in basically any heating device. So I'm talking about an iron, like a domestic iron for ironing clothes, a toaster oven, a hairdryer, a hot air gun, just about anything really and allow the PID controller to monitor and control the temperature. Now you could take one of these K-type thermocouples and insert it into a copper block and then clamp that directly to the hot plate. And that way you could control the temperature right at the surface of the hot plate very easily. Similarly, if you were to insert this into the flow of hot air in a hot air gun, you could, you know, once again allow the PID controller to switch it on and off to keep a temperature, you know, within, you know, two or three degrees, maybe more, not sure. But, you know, you've got to think uh, laterally and figure out what else you could use this for. I've also just put this little brass sliding um, finger on there so they can hook that over the corner of the pot and there's less chance that that's going to fall out. All right, I'm going to heat up these uh, Parker phosphate solutions and we'll give it a crack. So this is our workflow. The parts will come out of our cleaner. They'll get a water rinse. They then go into this solution here. This is called a Metex M activator for phosphate. So that's just a, a dip in there for about one minute. Comes out of there, gets a clean water rinse. It then goes into our pot of boiling water uh, where it comes up to temperature. From there, it goes into our Parker phosphate solution between 10, 15 minutes and that will turn the part black and make the surface of that slightly porous. That porosity is what absorbs the oil, which is the last step, and that's out in the crock pot heating up now. During this cleaning phase, the most important thing is you don't touch the metal parts with your bare hands. So use a glove, not to protect your skin, it's just to stop you from getting any oils from your fingers onto the clean metal parts. So that's had a good scrub with a toothbrush and then we do a water break test. So what that means is that you should not see the water bead anywhere on the part. If you do, you've got to repeat that cleaning process. And not sure if you can see there, but that water is just clinging in a film over the part so we know that there's no grease or oil or wax anywhere. Remember that if you do get beads in the water it means the water's not physically touching the seal. It's just sitting on a film of wax or oil underneath the bead of water. So that now is ready to go into our Metex M activator. So let's go and do that. Okay so straight from our cleaning we're going to go into the activator for between one and two minutes. Now I'm not sure, but I believe this is uh, like an acid process. I can see bubbles appearing on the surface of the steel. And after our two minutes, we're going to give this a water rinse and then it's going to go into our hot water bath. Okay, well there's our two minutes, so I'm gonna go and give that a rinse. So temperature here, just uh, just boiling temperature, and we need to leave that for one minute. All right, there's our minute, so that's going to come out and straight into our Parker phosphate solution. And 
and as you can see, <laughs> I didn't put enough in there. So I'm going to keep turning that over. It's probably bad planning on my part when, you know, it's going to be harder to get a consistent colour. However, lesson learned. So already I can see that going sort of a medium grey. So the time schedule here is between 10 and 15 minutes and I'm guessing that the longer you leave it, the darker it's going to get. What I'm after is, is you know, as black as I can get it. That's looking promising anyway. So I'm guessing you're looking at all of this and saying, well, gee, it's, it's a lot of work, <laughs> a lot of chemicals, a lot of stuff and equipment and so on. But what I'm planning to do is to get things ready in batches. So I've got actually three individual tools that I'm doing today. So there's this one, a little die holder, and also a chuck key. And this is really an experiment. And if it proves to be successful, then I know that I can do parts in batches and get them done with, you know, minimal setup time. You know, you wouldn't want to be doing this just ad hoc. You sort of need to plan ahead, make sure that you, uh, you have a batch that you want to get done all in the one day. Now, of course, gunsmiths have this gear set up, you know, permanently because they would be treating parts on a regular basis and they would have purpose-made tanks and troughs and heaters and so on. But for me, uh, and the way I do things, it's easier to just pack this stuff away and just get it out when I need it. Okay, let's come back in about 10 minutes and see how that looks. Well, it's been in there about 10, 12 minutes now, and I don't know if it's going to go any darker. It's got a sort of a uniform dark grey. It's certainly not black. But let's go and uh, rinse this down and put it in the, uh, the final treatment, which is our dry touch oil. Okay, I've just um, dunked that in the dry touch oil. And now, to me, this just looks like ordinary old water-soluble oil that you might use on a, a lathe or a milling machine. And I think the purpose of this is just to allow that porous surface that's been created by the Parker Phosphate solution to absorb that oil. Now the instructions say to hang that part now until it's completely dry. So the colour looks a little bit darker now and a little bit more uniform. But let's do that, let's hang it up and we'll check it out when it's dry. I'll just let that dry for about uh, 15 minutes and I've wiped that down with a clean cloth. The finish on it is rather curious. It's almost like it's been bead blasted or sandblasted. It's got a texture that you can feel. It's certainly not shiny like it was after I finished polishing it. But the colour now is quite uniform, which is a good thing. And although, you know, I wouldn't describe that as black, it's more like a charcoal colour. Uh, I believe that uh, you get different colours depending on the, the properties of the steel that you're treating. Anyway, let's put this together and see what it looks like. Well, there it is, and I'm guessing only time will tell now. We're going to have to leave this and see whether it does corrode like all the other parts that I've made here in the shop. <laughs> certainly, certainly this is going to corrode, but I don't feel like dismantling this and using the same treatment on that. I'm just going to have to keep that oiled, maybe. Anyway, let's have a look at the other two parts that I treated. Well, there are the other two parts. So this is just a chuck key and this is the little uh, die holder. The finish is really curious. Uh, not quite what I expected, but uh, it's almost like it's crystalline. I don't know if you can see that. It's got that slightly sparkly look to it that you get when you've done something with sandblasting. And I'm guessing that we're just going to have to leave these now and you know, check back later and just see whether they are in fact corrosion resistant. Certainly the colour's good, um, I'm happy with that. It's not black, but you know, it's, uh, it's uniform and that was the important thing. Okay, so um, I'm going to leave that there now. I did say I was going away on holiday and I haven't gone yet. I was able to get this video together in a day, so I'm going to put it up there and see what you think. 
and uh, we'll come back maybe after I've come back from my holiday we'll have a look at them because they certainly would have been sitting out and uh, you know going through that process of cooling down at night getting that slight moisture film on them and uh, you know if we get a rust film on it then well I've failed anyway I'll check you when I'm back from a holiday and uh, have a good one see ya